My name is Mark Tinsley. Mr. Tinsley, how are you doing today? Good. Uh, very quickly, you understand, obviously you're a lawyer, you understand we're here for some uh, in-camera proceedings, so we're not going to go into every bit of background and detail that we would where you're testifying before the jury. you understand that? I do. I do want to, though, kind of move through quickly some of the subject matter that the state uh, proposes to, uh, to put before the jury. Uh, but very quickly, if you would, just quickly tell us what you do for a living and what, what kind of practice that you have. Uh, my name is Mark Tinsley. I practice law in Allendale. I have a fairly uh, statewide practice, primarily personal injury, um, plaintiff's work. All right. And uh, <clears throat> how long have you been practicing in Allendale? Since 2000, so 22, 23 years. Do you have a statewide practice, or is it primarily? To the extent I want it statewide. I mean, I, I handle cases uh, statewide if, if I'm inclined to handle those. OK. Uh, primarily focused in the 14th Circuit, is that fair? 14th and the 1st. And the 1st? OK. Do you know the defendant, Alec Murdoch? I do. And how did you get to know him? Um, he's in, he practiced law in the adjoining county. Uh, I had a number of cases with his firm, uh, small bars in the two counties, and known him since shortly after I came to Allendale. And do you know other lawyers in the what used to be known as PMPD firm? All of them. And are those uh, individuals that you may have had cases with or just generally in the same line of work with over the years? Yes. Um, I want to take you to uh, February 19, and are you familiar with the uh, boat case? Unfortunately. Okay. And do you represent uh, the Beach family uh, in the lawsuit related to the death of Miss Mallory Beach? I do. And ultimately, uh, you ended up uh, accepting that representation <coughs> and filing suit against a number of defendants, including uh, the criminal defendant here, Alec Murdoch. Is that I did. Correct? Okay. Tell the court just very quickly who the defendants that you sued, at least initially, at, at when this case started. Uh, Mr. Waters, I, my recollection is is that I sued uh, Alec Murdoch. Uh, I, I know I sued Luther's, uh, which is a bar downtown in Beaufort. I sued the Woods, which was where the kids had gone for an oyster roast. I sued the Murdoch Family Trust, uh, which owned the property where the boat was launched from, and we believed that there could have been some drinking that went on there. Um, I'm not 100% certain in the first lawsuit if I sued Buster Murdoch, which is uh, Alex's son. Um, but I, I think those were the defendants initially. Okay. And, and maybe, uh, maybe Randolph Murdoch personally as well. Um, not long after you uh, started the boat case and, and uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, did your client, Renee Beach, have any particular experience at the scene that informed how you were handling this particular case as you went forward? She certainly had an experience that prompted uh, the call to me. Okay. Now, can you explain that to the court, please? She, um, she wanted to go down to uh, the bridge where the boat crash had occurred. I don't believe, I think this was either Monday or Tuesday, so the, the crash happens early Sunday morning. Um, the scene's cordoned off, and uh, she's told she can't go down there. And just a few minutes later, um, Alex's father and his wife pull up in a car, and they're waved under the tape, and they go down to the bridge. And, and she, she was very upset by that. Okay. And uh, did she, um, in your discussions with her, did she give you any particular instructions about uh, proceeding forward in this particular case as part and based on that experience? No, no, um, nobody really gives me instructions. <laughs> I understand. All right. Um, the, uh, not long after you get involved in this case, uh, did you have any uh, um, chance to review and look at any insurance coverages that may be available to the defendant? Sure. Um, my recollection is within a week, certainly 
uh, two week kind of time frame after the boat crash, Danny Henderson, who uh, was handling the boat crash as Alex's personal lawyer, brought me all of Alex's insurance policies. And so I reviewed them at that time before I filed the lawsuit. Now, what was the purpose of you reviewing those policies? Um, you know, in a civil case, the only thing that we can do to try to, under the law, make a party whole is recover money damages. And oftentimes, when we are um, drafting lawsuits, we will try to draft the initial lawsuit to make sure that there's insurance coverage. So, so that was the reason I wanted the, the coverage. And, and beyond that, sometimes, uh, like I did with some of the initial defendants, you can, because of the circumstances, because of the culpability, how bad the liability is, how catastrophic the loss is, many times insurance companies can be leveraged to pay their insurance out to get, this, get these people closure. No amount of money is going to make them whole. Um, so the best that we can do is try to get them some closure and help them heal. All right. And what did you determine as you looked at what coverages uh, were available to Alec that potentially could be relevant to the boat crash? Well, so there was $500,000 that Progressive had on the boat. It was a watercraft policy. Although I've never seen the policy, that insurance was offered uh, almost immediately uh, to all of the victims, um, not just the Beach family. There were two other girls on the boat uh, and two other boys, and in, including Paul Murdoch. Um, and so when I reviewed the policies, it was apparent to me that there was no possibility that any of the insurance that he had at the time of the boat crash would apply uh, to this, and if there was a possibility, it would be limited to an idea that uh, Alec was negligent in allowing Buster to give Paul his duplicate ID that he had made so Paul could purchase alcohol. Did uh, Alec have a policy, an umbrella policy with Nautilus at this point in time that was available? He, he, he did not. He had... And explain um, that to the court why that was not available, please. It, it, it appeared from review of the records that um, there was an open claim when the policy came up for renewal, and that open claim was the Satterfield matter, um, and that it was Nautilus and I think Lloyd's of London, and they would not renew the policy, and so he had to then seek other coverage, and what he ended up uh, was with Philadelphia, and, and it was a commercial hunting operation policy that contained uh, very broad watercraft exclusion. So they even uh, barred a negligent entrustment claim uh, as it related to a watercraft. And that Philadelphia policy depended on Moselle being considered as a commercial hunting lodge, is that correct? Not only Moselle, but, but the occurrence, in other words, whatever it is that causes there to be coverage had to arise out of a commercial operation, as I read the policy. Um, <clears throat> realizing that as it related to LA um, specifically there was was he essentially underinsured as it related to what the recovery you were seeking in this particular case? Oh, absolutely. Right. And what was your w ultimate goal though in seeking recover as, recovery as it related to Alec in this case? Well my, it, it, it changed over time. And I mean, initially, um, I believed that the case would settle. Um, I, I didn't see how people could ignore uh, the significance of the loss, the public support of the community for the Beach family, um, and then the hue and cry as it related to the liability and the Murdochs in particular. Um, and so, you know, it, it changes over time, but, but the one consistency was to get the case resolved. Okay. And uh, did you make it clear to uh, Alex's attorneys that uh, you were seeking a personal recovery that he would have to pay as opposed to just accessing what insurance co coverage was available? Always. And that was consistent all the way through, is that all, correct? All the way through. Were you making substantial demands to the defense that Alec pay its uh, substantial recovery personally? You know, 
I, I think by, by most standards, and I don't want to seem crass when I say this, but the Beach family stood on the causeway for eight days while their daughter's body was in the water. Um, I don't know that there's any amount of money that would, somebody would willingly take to go through what they've gone through. Um, but, but if you were asking a lawyer who does civil work, uh, was I making a substantial demand in terms of a settlement? I think that most people would say yes. In your assessment, did that come as a bit of a, or did the defense express to you surprise uh, that you were seeking a personal recovery from Allied rather than just simply trying to access what insurance coverage he had? Um, yeah, so, some, some people did. Um, John Tiller was primarily handling the case for LA, and I didn't get that from John, but, but I got it from a lot of people. Um, in August of 2019, uh, is there a particular conference that those uh, in your line of work go to? Uh, it used to be called the Trial Lawyers Conference, um, but yeah, it, it's in Hilton Head, and, and I went in 2019 of August. Did you see the defendant there? I did. And did you have a conversation with him about the boat case? I did. All right. Can you relate that conversation to the court, please? Yeah. Um, I think, I'm not 100% certain that it was a fundraiser, either for Mr. Harpootlian or it was a fundraiser for Lindsey Graham. Uh, as you come into the hotel, there's a, there's a gathering area. It's in the evening before. Um, everyone goes to dinner or it's immediately after I'm not 100% certain uh, but the room's full of lawyers and Alex sees me and he comes across and he gets up close in my face and says hey Bo what's this I'm hearing about what you're saying I thought we were friends and I replied Alex we are friends uh, if you don't think I can burn your house down and that I'm that that I'm not doing everything, and I'm not going to do everything you're wrong, you need to settle this case. Okay. And so what was the point of that conversation? What, what was, uh, if you can explain to the court what y'all were talking about, what, what is, what is Alec upset to as you understood it? That he was going to have to pay was, was what he was hearing. That's what it was, that's what the, the point of it was, we're friends, I took it as he tried to intimidate me, he didn't intimidate me. Uh, and, and sort of bully me into backing off. Um, was there a uh, mediation in September of 2019? There was. No, uh, 20. Uh, September of 20. 20. Um, before we get there, we move into uh, early March uh, of 2020, and we probably all know the answer to this, but what happened in March of 2020 that kind of changed the world? Yeah. COVID, the court shut down. And did that have an effect on slowing down things in the court systems? It, it, it definitely stopped the court system. Um, we continued to take some uh, depositions, pr primarily law enforcement. It was at the scene um, early on, and then ultimately when everything finally shut down, I'm not sure if it's, if it's May or April, when then you know, we were sort of confined to our offices. Did you... Uh, during the course of COVID, I uh, take the opportunity to sort of present the case to a mock jury to get an, an idea of how that jury might respond. I did. All right. And were the results very favorable for your client and not favorable for Alec? They were. Okay. Did you ultimately communicate that fact to the defense? I did. <clears throat> Had you come into possession of some social media videos that uh, you believe would be very uh, advantageous to proving your case and achieving the large recovery? I did. Um, and I shared those with John Tiller. Um, let me get something marked real quick. Hold on. show you what's been marked as Exhibit 401, States Exhibit 401, 
and see if you recognize that document. I did. I do. All right. And what is that document? Uh, it's a screenshot of text messages uh, between myself and Tabor Vox. Tabor is assisting me in the boat crash case. All right. Could you put, turn the screen to me real quick, please? All right, there's a reference here at the top. They damn sure aren't a placeholder or venue defendant, but they were hoping so. And uh, then you respond about not walking, just taking 500K and not walking away from someone who's judgment proof. Is that correct? That's, that's right. And I, I'm sure the court is aware, but just very quickly, what, what are you, what's being said there about Alec not being just a placeholder or venue defendant? Well, um, so there, there are a couple of things going on here. Um, in October of, um, when he, I filed a motion to compel, um, Ellick said he was broke. He doesn't have any money. He may be able to cobble together some amount of money, but he's broke. And, and I didn't believe it. So I filed a motion to compel. And about a week after I'd filed that motion to compel, uh, Danny Henderson, who again was Ellick's personal lawyer, came to my partner, uh, said he couldn't believe that we were going after Ellick personally. Um, it was a line in the sand that I had crossed, a number of things like that. So that's what this conversation is about. Um, and, you know, by, by November, this is, I think, November of 2020, um, the Beach family, they want accountability. They, they, they want a pound of flesh, and whatever that's going to be, it's only going to be through a jury. Uh, or through a substantial settlement. All right, well, let me back up and we'll get to the motion to compel in a second. You mentioned that you had uh, been told by the defense essentially that Alec had no money, correct? He's broke. Did, right, did they say he could cobble together a certain amount? I thought he could cobble together a million dollars. A million dollars. And did you believe that that was accurate? It couldn't have been. All right, and why did you not believe that that was accurate? Well, uh, when you practice law, uh, not necessarily with, uh, it, it meaning in the same case, but, but when you go to a roster meeting, uh, if there were 50 cases on the roster in Hampton, Ellick may have had 50 or 60 of those percent of those cases. And so they're actively being settled. Uh, I know that he's actively making money and you just can't possibly be broke uh, if you're making money, not the way he was making money. And then beyond that, I'm, I mean, my clients have known Ellick uh, and his family forever, and so their perspective is that there's generational wealth as well. Did you, uh, was $1 million going to be enough money from your client's perspective to settle this case? It, it, it wasn't enough from, from my perspective. Okay. I can explain that if you want. Yes, please. Yeah. So one of the things that I didn't appreciate that I came to appreciate by this point in time was, is that, it, it, and it may not make a whole lot of sense, but if I, if I told a lawyer who, do, who does what I do that I'd settled the case, uh, there's a lot of speculation because I've had cases with the firm and members of the firm are my friends, uh, that somehow there's a fix on. I think for a long time, Ellick thought there was a fix on, that, that he was just a placeholder or venue defendant. Right. Um, and, and so if I, if I told you I've settled the case, and then the next question would be, what did, you, what did you settle it for? I said, well, I took the insurance company. If you knew what I know uh, and what plaintiff's lawyers know, you'd think, well, there was a fix. The only reason I would take it is because there was a fix. I didn't see a substantial difference between that number and a million dollars. Um, and so I thought that if you told 10 lawyers who were knowledgeable about these kinds of matters. I took a million dollars from Ellick, who from everyone's perspective has lots of money, is making piles of money. They would think that it was a fix. So, so before we even get to what's a fair amount, what, what should you take? You know, I, the analogy I use with my clients is, it's kind of like that show deal or no deal. You may have the million dollars suitcase or you may have a zero suitcase. And, but it's not until there's a significant enough offer that you could do worse um, that you should settle a case, any case. And, and, that's, and so 
at a million dollars, it just wasn't, there wasn't any risk to them that would prompt me to recommend them to take it. Um, did you uh, make any sort of formal or informal offer to them that involved the real property as well as any sort of payment plan? When, when I was told that Ellick was broke, I offered him a payment plan. Sometimes when you settle cases, medical malpractice cases, for instance, with the JUA, they will make payments. Uh, I offered to, for him to sign over Moselle and the beach house, open his books to see that he was broke, and, and then work out a payment plan on the balance. So when you say, okay, you say he's broke, I don't believe that. Show me the books to prove that. What was your response from, the, uh, from Alex's defense? Well, it was sort of stonewalling uh, to begin with. I mean, ultimately, I got a formal response, which was an objection that prompted the motion to compel in October of 2020. Let me get this mark real quick. I'll show you what's been marked as States 402. See if you recognize this document. Yeah, so th this is um, my motion to compel, which attaches um, Ellick's responses to the interrogatories and requests for production. All right, and when was this filed? October 16th, 2020. All right. Uh, exhibit B to this motion, your motion to compel up on the screen and zoom it in a little bit. And in part, was this the objection to one of your uh, supplemental interrogatories about what you're talking about, about uh, opening the books? Correct. All right. And if you would, tell me what your interrogatory was asking for in number one, please. Well, in, in as broad a term, it, it, it well, let's just read it real quick if we could, please. Can all right. Read that? List all checking and or savings accounts, including credit union accounts, certificates of deposit, 401k accounts, uh, SEP accounts, IRA maintained by you, IRAs maintained by you individually and or jointly with any others or any other accounts over which you had signature authority in any capacity regardless of whether or not the account or accounts have been closed from February 2019 to present. Right. And ultimately, what was the uh, Alex defense's response to that, generally? You don't it, have to read that, but just tell me. It, it was overly broad, unduly burdensome, and irrelevant. Okay. And so ultimately, you filed a motion to compel. Is that correct? That's correct. And the idea was, if you say you're broke, show me the books, and, to, and they had refused to with the response to this interrogatory, as well as others. Is that correct? Correct. To your knowledge, when uh, information was being gathered by the defendant in this particular case, who, let me ask you this, who were his attorneys in, in the boat case, Alex's attorneys? So his personal attorney, as I've said, was Danny Henderson, uh, who is also a partner or shareholder with PMPD. Um, Progressive had hired John Tiller, and John Tiller uh, was a lawyer out of Charleston. He was mainly involved. At one point, there was Amy Bauer, who was an associate working with John Tiller and then Elliot Condon ultimately. I think Amy left in February of 21, and by then I think uh, Elliot Condon had been hired and was assisting John Tiller. Okay. And uh, 
Uh, Mr. Henderson is a partner in PMPED. It was also actively helping Alec or representing Alec in this case, is he, that correct? He was. And he's the one that initially had brought you the insurance coverages for Alec to get you a, a chance to look at them and see what might be available, correct? That's right. Um, as this motion to compel gets filed, uh, what if anything happened with the uh, sort of the communications between your side and the defense side as we moved into the months uh, following uh, the filing of that motion to compel? We all already saw the one text. What else is going on as well? Well, there's there's a lot of grumbling and and sort of shock that I'm actually going to hold Alec personally responsible. Not so much with me, but like I mentioned, about a week after this, Danny Henderson uh, contacts my partner. There were a number of times when Tabor Vox was contacted. Um, and, and so nobody says anything directly to me in, in terms of that regard, but that's, that's what's going on. It was, it was said to them because they knew it would then be told to me. When we look at the uh, particular interrogatory right here that you have filed a motion to compel on, and what are you trying to get? What, what information are you trying to get with that interrogatory? Well, you know, the, the way to, again, like, like I, in my example of the deal or no deal, I mean, what I'm trying to do is put pressure. He doesn't want me to have access to his accounts. At the time, I think, it's because I, he'll see, I'll see how much money he actually is making and how much he has. Um, and so, you know, that's what I'm trying to do is put pressure on him to force him into a settlement. He did, you don't want it disclosed? Here are the keys to the jail. Um, you enter into an agreement and let's go settle the case. In the event, though, he doesn't settle in response to this, what information are you trying to get? Well, it, it, it's certainly not a number. Uh, it's certainly not Ellick's estimation of what his net value is. I wanted the accounts because I knew that the only way that he could be broke is that money had been hidden. And so I, I was going to look for and trace uh, or begin that process of doing that. All right, and explain that to the court. When you say that you knew that if he was, quote, broke, in your estimation, money had been hidden, and so therefore you were going to look for and trace that information. What do you mean by that? Why did you think money had been hidden? Well, they just, there, there wasn't any way he could be broke. I mean, I, you know, I, I know he's actively settling cases. Uh, some cases, big cases, some cases, small cases, but they stack up lots of cases. He's handling a lot of cases. Uh, so there, there's just no possibility that he could be broke um, by anyone's definition. If ultimately, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, um, if ultimately you had been successful in, in uh, getting a list of the defendant's accounts, what would have been your next step? Once you've seen? Subpoenas. Of to, those to, accounts? Uh, to those institutions, yes. Um, were you already aware that defendant had an account at the Bank of America? I, I knew that he had a personal account with Bank of America. I knew he had an account with Palmetto State Bank. So I'm, I'm looking for the balance of accounts in terms of institutions and where else he had. But you didn't know how many accounts or what those balances were or anything I, like that? No, I, I had no idea. I had, you know, I knew he had multiple business entities. He had different LLCs. Um, so I imagine there could be any combination of accounts out there and some which would not have even been in his name. After uh, the motion to compel is filed, I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as States 403 and see if you recognize that document. Yes. Tell me what that is. Again, it's a um, screenshot of text messages between Tabor Vox and myself. All right. Let me put this up on the screen. All right, 
if you would, um, got this up on the screen. So can you tell me what's going on? And again, this is in April of 2021, is that correct? It is. And tell me what's going on with this conversation right here and how it relates uh, to these issues. Yeah, so in August of 20, I found out I had cancer. And um, by November, I knew how bad it was. And so in January, I went to, uh, I had stage four cancer and I went to Florida from the end of January till April the 15th on my first round of treatment. So I'd, I'd just come back. Um, shortly before I was diagnosed with cancer, John Tiller was also diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer. And um, there's some degree of urgency between John Tiller and myself to finish this case. Um, while I was in Florida, um, I, I think I failed to mention that Greg uh, Parker's convenience store was also a defendant in the first case, but Greg Parker had done a number of things. And so, so before I leave, um, the issue is, is Greg Parker's move to transfer venue to Beaufort County uh, which is where I had done the mock jury, the focus group was in Beaufort County. And um, while I'm in Florida, things have changed in terms of what he's done that have changed my perspective because when I left, I intended to go to Beaufort. By the time I get back, I think I'm staying in Hampton. And, and so this conversation is for the first time I've said that I'm gonna leave the case in Hampton, um, but if I, if I think that Alec has fixed the jury, that he's done anything to affect the, the outcome of the trial, that I'm gonna sue Paul and Maggie the next day in Beaufort. And was that communicated to the defense? Absolutely. Um, in the course of your investigation of this case, had you taken depositions of some of the officers who were involved in the investigation? We did. And at some point was that uh, some issues arose that were uh, communicated to, uh, um, to the state grand jury? Um, you're the one that tells me everything happens there is secret, so you tell me, but... Uh, I'm asking you today. But yes. Ultimately, and while you were in Florida in March and April of 2021, uh, to your understanding, had the state grand jury reached out to you for information that you had uncovered in your investigation of the investigation into the boat crash? Correct. And, and specifically the handling of the criminal investigation by law enforcement. The investigation into the investigation. Correct. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 404, 405, and 406 to your, uh, for this hearing and see if you recognize those, please, generally. I do. All right. And tell me what that, what's going on here, please. Um, there were a number of motions pending uh, in the boat crash case. They had been pending for some time. I mentioned one a moment ago, a motion to transfer venue. Uh, there were some motions to amend, um, and, and so Judge Hall had set those motions to be heard. My recollection is May the 10th, 2021, so I'm, I'm back now. I got a couple weeks to sort of uh, get my wits about what's going on and, 
the, the motions are scheduled to be heard. And that's May 11th, 2021? 20, uh, it's, it's either the 10th or the, my recollection is the 10th. I know the emails say something different, but, um, and in, in the week before, I don't know that John Tiller always knew uh, how many chemotherapy treatments he was gonna get or how long they were gonna last until almost immediately before. So on, on or about May the 7th, uh, John knew that the day of our hearing, uh, his chemotherapy was gonna run long and he wouldn't be done. And, and he had asked the judge to continue the motions, including the motion to compel. All right. And looking at, again, we're now looking at um, states 405. Uh, what, uh, what was the judge's initial response to Mr. Tiller's uh, request to have that hearing continued based on his chemotherapy? That we were going forward um, as scheduled and that um, it says Mr. Condon, but it meant Ms. Condon uh, would be able to handle it. All right, looking at states 406, um, what happened after that? Uh, ultimately, what happened is, I, my recollection is, I sent another email to the judge um, expressing that I, I really didn't have, they were, they were mainly my motions, they were, Parker's had some motions, but uh, that I didn't have a problem with continuing to accommodate Mr. Tiller, and the judge finally set a, a status conference for, um, maybe it was May the 11th. All right. Judge Hall um, did not want to continue the May 2021 hearing, saying that there was another lawyer on for Alex's side that can handle it, correct? Correct. And then you kind of interceded and said that this this would work, and so it was rescheduled. Is that correct? After a status conference. After but the status conference, it was rescheduled at that status conference? It, it was rescheduled to uh, June 10th. June 10th. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 407 and States 408. And just quickly tell me if you generally recognize those documents. I do. One, one is an email um, from John Tiller saying that the judge's law clerk uh, said that the judge would be sending a message re uh, telling us that the hearing was going to be rescheduled to June 10th. The other is the email from the law clerk. All right, so the hearing that was initially in May that Judge Hall did not want to reschedule um, was rescheduled for June 10th, 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. And ultimately, that would be to hear a number of things, but one of the most significant things would be uh, your request for um, a list of all checking accounts uh, from Alec, all identification of all accounts. Is that correct? It, it, it is correct that that motion was going to be heard. And um, Ultimately, when the murders happen, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 408. What happened to that particular hearing that was scheduled that way? Uh, it was continued. All right. And is that what's reflected in this email right here? It, it is. And then Exhibit 407? It is. After the murders happened, was, let me ask you this. You've known Alec and have worked with him for a number of cases, is that correct? I, I had not worked with Alec in a number of cases, but I'd known him for a long time. Okay, but you had, you were generally familiar with him as a lawyer, is that right? I was. And what was your assessment of his skills as a plaintiff lawyer? What was he particularly good at? He was particularly good at um, reading people, making people feel like uh, they were the most important person in the room, and 
capitalizing on surprise with the defense. You have a case with Alec. He hasn't done anything. It's Monday morning of the roster. Maybe you expect it to be continued. And he says, I'm ready for trial. And so he, would, he leveraged a lot of settlements that way. All right. Was he good at understanding the emotional and sympathetic aspects of, of plaintiff's work and tort work that can be so crucial in defining what recoveries can be in these types of cases? Yeah, I, I think he was particularly good at reading people and, and knowing what made people tick. You've testified that you had made it very clear to the defense throughout this time period that you were seeking a substantial personal recovery from Alec and had been told, well, he's broke, which you then responded, I don't believe that. Show me the books, correct? Correct. And that was what was on the table for June 10th, 2021, correct? Among other things, but Among yes. other things. But that's on the table, correct? Correct. Um, after the murders happened, did that have any effect on your assessment of the case against Alec, and particularly as it relates to the sympathies and the emotion of the case, which can be so important to recovery. Uh, I mean, yeah, yes. Uh, Explain that to the court then. Well, uh, initially, um, probably say the first week, there was the shock and horror of what had happened. And, and, and nobody really thought about anything other than that. Um, but pretty quickly, I recognized that um, the case against Alec, if he were a victim of some vigilante, would in fact be over. It would be over. It would be over. And explain just quickly to the court why that's the case. Well, you know, when you're asking for a money judgment, um, people have to be motivated to give you that money judgment. Um, if you represent Attila the Hun uh, versus some sweet old grandmother, nobody's going to give Attila the Hun money. Uh, they would give money to some sweet grandmother. So if, if Alec had been victimized by a vigilante, um, nobody would have brought a verdict back against Alec. And, and, and I had other defendants in the case, um, so I would have ended the case against Alec. You would have ended the case against Alec with just? You know, I, 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 I probably, I mean, certainly there was $500,000 in insurance that was offered. Um, I may have tried to see if he could cobble together the million dollars. But whatever the last offer would have been from Alec's side, that would have been the offer that we took. You had mentioned before that you had advised the defense of some of the mock jury presentations that you had done and some of the results from that and how they were very favorable to your case. Is that correct? The defense and some of Alec's partners, but yes. And it's fair to say, though, that as you just stated, that if Alec had been the victim of some sort of vigilante, uh, those sympathies would have entirely changed as it related to Alec and Paul as well. Is that correct? Certainly. And that's led to what you, your assessment then in the wake of these murders, is that correct? Correct. At some point, uh, did you receive any call or any communication from the Satterfields about uh, the any recovery and the Gloria Satterfield death? Uh, at, at, at some point, my recollection is it's early September of 21, uh, uh, Eric Harriet came to my office about, <coughs> about that. There are a number of articles in the paper or the papers that are talking about this previous wrongful death case and wrongful death settlement. Um, and, and he came to my office at that time. All right. And did you uh, send them send them to someone? I sent him to Eric Bland. Come on, probably one second.
further at this time, Your Honor. By the defense. Good morning, Mr. Sinsel. How are you? Um, you testified at length uh, to the state grand jury, basically, this, this similar testimony you're giving here today. Is that correct? Uh, the testimony I gave today is included in what I said to the state grand jury, yes. And it, it seems like the, the gist of this is that um, you were suing Alex Murdoch, who um, you believed was underinsured. For, for this incident, and you're going to go after his personal assets, and that was going to put some financial pressure on him. Is that correct? Uh, not probably not exactly. I mean, I don't mean to quibble with you over the words you used, but um, I don't think it was financial pressure because I didn't. I mean, I was holding him personally accountable. I was insisting that he pay. Uh, I didn't see how a payment plan on a settlement. Would put any pressure on Alec. It was um, sort of a deal that he couldn't turn down from where I sat. But you were asking for money. From oh, him. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the inquiry here today is about money, his money, his finances, correct? I don't think so, but um, it certainly concerns his money. And you're uh, anticipating you're going to go to trial, is that correct? Yes. You're going to go to trial. Uh, and get a verdict against Alex Murdoch, correct? That was what you thought that's where this was going? No, I, I mean, I didn't see how any reasonable person wouldn't settle the case, especially Alec. Um, so I, I expected the case to settle. 90% of cases settled, maybe 99. But if we had to try it, yes, we were going to try it. And if he were unable to offer more money, um, then your expectation on, say, on June 7th, you know, for these murders, your expectation was if he doesn't offer more money, we're going to trial. Any money. Right. It was, it was no money. It, right. no, no money had been offered. So your expectation then was we're going to trial. It, if you offer me no money in a case that I'm pursuing against you, then, then the response is uh, we are going to trial. And, and you were pretty far from trial on June 7th, uh, 2021, were you not? No. You, you believe you were close to taking it to trial? I, I, there was an urgency because John Taylor knew that he had about a year to live. And, and we were going to try that case. Um, my expectation was early fall, late summer. You expected to try the, the, the boat case in the summer of 2020, late summer of 2021? August, September, October, sometime in that time. You felt like you were only two or three months away from trial? Sure even though we had all these pending motions that hadn't even been heard, including what venue to have? I had tried the case two times with a Beaufort jury in, during COVID. Um, I was ready to go to trial. At, on, on that day, on June 7th, you hadn't even uh, yet asserted a negligent entrustment claim against Alex Ed. Well, I had with John Tiller. John Tiller knew and had agreed to the amendment. Right. There were a number of things that Alex counsel had agreed to including knowing that uh, there was substantial punitive evidence in the case. And but you, at that time, you hadn't even asserted that claim to the court. That well, wasn't before the court, was it? That was just a conversation with John Tiller. That's the conversation that mattered, because John Tiller would be the one who would object to the late presentation of the evidence, the late presentation of an expert, and he had agreed to all those things. But he had objected to the financial discovery you asked for. Well, there was an objection posed, correct? But he, he did object to that. When that answer was given in uh, October or September of 20, it was an objection. And the hearing that was that this that motion to compel the financial detail, the testimony is that's just one of many motions that needed to be heard. Is that correct? Correct. There there are many motions that had piled up and needed to be heard. There were several. There were several. Do you remember what they all were? There was a motion to change venue. Um, 
there was a motion to compel against Parker's. There was, uh, Parker's had one or two motions. Some of the motions got resolved, um, one of which was this motion to assert admiralty in the case and with the agreement that I would amend uh, to assert your negligent entrustment claim to get in all of the evidence that they knew I had, um, that was resolved that way. And you, you've had a lot of motions practice in this case with Parker's, haven't you? More so since the murder. Um, but has that motions practice with Parker's been about the murders of Maggie and Paul? Uh, well, I, I mean, it, it's, it's about it in the sense that, um, that, that it certainly created uh, a lot of additional issues to deal with, but no, not specifically. There was, there was a lot of motion practice about allegations of leaking of video from mediation, for example, correct? I don't know about a lot, but th there, I had filed a motion um, that I ultimately withdrew. And uh, you believe that you were going to drag Parkers to a trial within two or three months, late summer of, of June 7th, even though we have all these fairly preliminary motions that haven't been heard, change of venue, asking to uh, amend pleadings, motions to compel discovery. Yeah, maybe you've never tried a civil case. So um, when COVID happened and everything was shut down for two months, I got my case together. My case is not dependent on uh, if, if I'm forced to try it, the bank institutions where he has accounts. My case is not dependent on the leaked video. That's a separate matter uh, and, and, and ended up being a separate lawsuit. Um, so the answer is yes. I was ready to try my case. And you didn't need, for example, uh, an answer on the motion to compel that was pending against Parker's. You didn't actually need any of that stuff to go to trial against Parker's. Is that what you're saying? The, the, you're talking about the, the percentage of financials, uh, I mean, percentage of sales that alcohol made up in his profits? No, I didn't need that. Well, let's put that up. I wanted it, but I didn't need it. Uh, it appears to be my motion to compel against Greg Parker's company. Can we pull up 82, please. And this is the document I've, uh, on the screen that I, I've handed to you. So we have, it's not just a, a Buried in here is some request for financial information, but you're requesting answers to request for production three, production, request for production 11, request for production 16, request for production 17, which is uh, financial information, request for production 18, request for production 19, request for production 20, request for production 22, <laughs> Request uh, interrogatory number five, interrogatory number eight, interrogatory number nine, interrogatory number 10, interrogatory number 12, interrogatory number 13, interrogatory number 15, interrogatory number 18. It, it seems like it's quite a bit of discovery you're demanding from Parker's in this motion. Which I would have had the answer to on June 10th. So e either I was getting it or I wasn't getting it, but, it, but it, my, my case wasn't dependent on these things. They may have helped my case. They may have put pressure on uh, Parker's camp like I was trying to put pressure on Ellick, but um, it wasn't, the trial wasn't dependent on these things. And uh, t turning to the motion to compel um, Alex, uh, first, do you believe that the, uh, the Judge Hall's um, initial request in May to go forward with pending motion hearings um, was telegraphing a ruling on that specific motion, or do you believe that that was uh, him looking at these motions piling up and wanting to get some movement? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I, 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 no, I, I, there's nobody in the courtroom, maybe, 
even including me, it wants the case resolved more than Judge Hall. And uh, when, uh, when the late Mr. Tiller asked um, for a, a continuance, uh, you don't believe that was any kind of stalling tactic, do you? No. That, that, that was a legitimate health-based concern. And if you read my emails, you would see that, that I immediately agreed to it. John Tiller was my friend. Um, with regards to what you're asking for from uh, Alex, let's maybe pull that up. This is the motion to compel. Can we pull up 80, please? It's already been uh, shown to you, but I'll show you when it's been marked as 80 for your reference. So this is asking for uh, an order compelling production on um, interrogatories 9 and 10, and then a set of supplemental uh, interrogatories and supplemental request for production, is that correct? It is. And if we turn to... Um, and 9 and 10 are important as well. We didn't cover that, but I'm happy to speak to 9 and 10 because, you know, 9 and 10 asked Alec about... So, sir, no, no one's asked you about okay. 9 and 10. Um, and we'll get to it, but first let's turn to um, answers to first supplemental interrogatories. This is the first page of Exhibit B. So we can see what it is that uh, is being asked for. Keep. There's no D in mine. I'm sorry. B. Oh, B? B. It's it's the first page of uh, what's Exhibit B in here. Uh, it's right there. That's it. It's the first page after the motion, so it'd be page nine of the PDF. They're not so numbered. So, Mr. I've Waters asked you about this list of all checking savings accounts, retirement accounts. Um, and then you, you don't have to, to highlight or, or expand this stuff. All stock, and then number two, all stock certificates, and we go to the next page. All property interest of property of every kind whatsoever um, from February 24, 2019 forward. All life insurance policies, uh, number four or five, all personal financial statements submitted to any bank, et cetera profit sharing plans, pension plans, et cetera. This is, doesn't this look like supplemental discovery after you get a judgment? Supplemental proceedings? Uh, I, I've never had been involved in supplemental proceedings, so no, I don't think so. This is what my people needed answers to before they would agree to take anything that Alec would have offered. In, in tort cases against individuals, you know, in this case, uh, a negligence in entrusting a, a boat and in a, an alcohol-related you know, incident. Before there's even motions for summary judgment, before there's any consideration of, of whether a case has been made for punitive damages, do you typically get this level of financial discovery of defendants? I think so. I think the judge ultimately agreed to give it to him. He agreed to give it to you? Sure. But I thought the hearing didn't happen. Well, you thought wrong. There's a lot of papers, so maybe you got confused. He granted this motion? I think so. You want to see the order? Yeah. It's uh, the record. October 7, 2021. To, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, what you've highlighted here is that um, Mr. T well, Tiller, Mr. Tiller, because of circumstances beyond his control, unable to gather, uh, provide necessary for information, or answer requests and interrogatories. Once the information is made available to Attorney Tiller, the court will schedule a hearing. If necessary, you forgot the last part. If necessary, the yes. court will schedule a hearing That's if right. necessary. Which means? If Mr. Tiller, the attorney on the case, can from his own client get the information. This is no way says that the court granted this motion, does it, sir? Uh, only to you, I think. I mean, it's clear that John said that Alec was unavailable because he was in rehab at the time. He couldn't get the material. Um, 
He's going to get the material, and the judge ordered you get the material, and if we need to schedule a hearing because you don't have the answers that you want, Mr. Tinsley, then we'll reschedule the hearing. I mean, this is an order that says the court will schedule a hearing on this motion to compel if necessary. It's My not only, granting the motion to compel, sir, is it? Oh, I think so. I think if he was just going to deny it, as you suggest, then it would have just said denied. Or it's, if it was it's granted, premature. Would you say granted? Well, I think that's what it says. It's a practical matter when parties have discovery motions, uh, oftentimes, like Alec is in his own statement said he was working on getting the answers. The reason is you give the answers because you don't want to face what could happen in the argument with the judge. So this, this, my point is, is that if the judge were going to say it's premature, you're not going to get it, it's denied, any of the things you suggested in your motion, uh, he would have said that. That's not what he did. That's not what happened. You asked for financial information uh, in the motion that was pending against Parker's that was also going to be heard on June 10th. That, you know, it, it was different and for different reasons. You asked for alcohol sales, correct? Mm -hmm. What I explained to Judge Hall was is that they say he's broke. And so before sir, my sir, no, sir, let me finish no, no, my no, sir, I'm asking what you asked for from Parker's. I'm pretty sure that wasn't they say he's broke. What were you asking for from Parker's? I asked for, among other things, the percent of uh, alcohol sales that made up his net profit, I believe. And this was like a dram shop action against Parker's, correct? They sold the alcohol. Like a dram shop right. action, okay. yes. And did you get a ruling on that, on that, that request for that financial information from Parker's that was going to be heard on that June 10th, they just, along with all these other motions that had piled up, in a case that apparently wasn't moving very well, quickly. Well, I, I understand you don't want to acknowledge what I've handed you, but... Um, Sir, I asked you what the ruling was on the motion uh, well, it, compelled it, from Parker's. It was very limited, and as it related to the percent of sales of alcohol that made up his profit, uh, it was premature. The judge ruled, unlike he did in that order I handed you, that it was premature at the time. Why was it premature? Well. The difference between Parker's and Ellick is, is that Ellick had, and his lawyers had, 25 videos of alcohol. They had the punitive damages evidence. You didn't see that with Parker's. It was just a straight up transaction in sale. So to the extent you're suggesting that there wasn't this evidence, there were these mere allegations of negligent parenting, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the you argument. You presented that evidence to the court? I didn't have to present it to the court. That's what you don't understand. John Tiller knew about it. John Tiller is the one who's responding because John Tiller knows ultimately he's going to be in front so of the you're judge. you're saying the court was granting your motion, though obviously it was saying there might be a hearing on the motion, and maybe at that hearing you would present some evidence in support. But I don't I think mean, that's what it says. I mean, you asked for financial information for Parker's. It was deemed premature because it related to punitive damages, correct? It, it, it was different than the motion that it related to Ellick. Because the law is how much money you have is a factor for punitive damages, correct? Well, you, you're, you're making statements of law. I'm telling you what was happening, and what was happening was is that Ellick's lawyers knew what the evidence was, they knew what the amendment was going to be and the allegations, and he knew ultimately he was going to be back in front of Judge Hall making some ridiculous argument that I appears you're suggesting now. And again, the gist of this is that there was perhaps going to be this judgment day, I think is a term the state has used, but that was going to be trial, right? That was going to be the verdict. That was going to be judgment day, not this motion hearing where there's a pile of motions that have piled up and we saw the one that asked for financial information was deemed premature. Not, <laughs> not at all. You know, what was going on is, as, as I've said a number of times, Danny Henderson was very involved. Danny Henderson was a shareholder. 
Before I would have gotten the bank account information, before I would have seen the records, Danny Henderson would have seen those records. And I've seen the records. I've seen all the bank statements now. It would have been apparent to Danny Henderson, and I believe it would have been apparent to me uh, what Alec had been doing. So that's the judgment day, is the discovery. And there were a lot of threads that were being pulled, uh, and it was subject to unraveling at any moment. And if those records were disclosed, if Danny Henderson reviewed those records, he would have known there's no way Alec's getting these checks, there's no way these checks are going to forge, there's no way that this money should be transferred. And even if, hypothetically, had this hearing on the 10th, and you got a different ruling um, regarding uh, Alex Murdaugh than you got against Parkers, that for some reason it's not premature to him, isn't it true all you would have been enabled, all you could have gotten would have been a, a net worth statement, financial statement? Not, not even remotely close. Isn't that, that, you don't, in your opinion, there's no case law out there saying that's what you get, you know, for, that's the measure for punitive damages, net worth. There's no such case, in your opinion, as an attorney. I had seven circuit court orders where the circuit court had ruled that you don't bifurcate discovery, that it wouldn't be proper to have denied the motion and then what are we going to do? We're going to try the case and suddenly we're going to stop the trial and go and do the discovery? No. And so I had seven circuit court orders that I handed up to Judge Hall that supported our position. I think that that's what Judge Hall did in his order. Uh, and, and again, you know, the issue is, is not that complicated. It's does he have the ability to pay? Is he broke such that these people sh should uh, accept this pitiful offer if he could cobble it together? But sir, that's not what you get on a motion to compel, is it? Right. You, you're, you're, you just said ability to pay so your client can make a decision on whether to accept a settlement offer, but that is not what the motion to compel is about, is it? It's about evidence for trial. The motion that's to the compel legal standard, is it not? No, the motion to compel was about putting pressure on Alec. I didn't really give two cents about whether or not uh, he ultimately had money, because I knew he had money. I didn't need those things. The fact that he didn't want me to have them is the reason that I'm pushing it. So, I just didn't know why he didn't want me to have them at the time. I do now. So the motion to compel was to put pressure on Alex. It wasn't about an expectation the judge was actually going to give you this stuff on, on June 10th? If you're a good plaintiff's lawyer, everything you do in a case is to put pressure on the other side. But the expectation of the outcome of a hearing on June 10th was not that you're going to get to launch a full-scale forensic audit because you had a conversation with someone who said, whose lawyer said, oh, he's, he's broke, and you didn't believe it. Not at that stage of the litigation, sir, is it? That's not what's, what's going to happen, is it? I don't think you need a full-scale forensic audit for something a five-year-old could see. Um, so, no. You wanted pre-trial ability to pay discovery to inform whether or not to accept a, a compulsive discovery, compelled, so that your client could decide whether or not to take a settlement offer. I know you don't like the answer, but I'm telling you, I did not care about the answer. What I cared about was putting pressure on Alec. I think that your assessment of the law is wrong, and I didn't really care whether I got it at the end of the day. I knew he didn't want me to have it. And so that's what I was doing was putting pressure on him. It would have suited me fine not to have ever gotten anything and to leverage it into a settlement and gone on about my way. But that's not what happened. So it was the motion was not about obtaining uh, information that may have been relevant at trial. It was about I, getting information to inform whether or not you want to, your client would take a settlement offer. What I told Judge Hall was, they say he's broke. My people have lived in Hampton their entire lives. They do not believe he's broke. If he's broke, we need to open the books and let them see it so that they can then form a, a, an informed uh, opinion about what they should do. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with, with the trial. It had to do with the case and resolving the case. And, and then I think we briefly touched on Satterfield. Just to be clear, they came to you, the first time they came into your office, or uh, any was September 21? It's, it's either late August or early September, um, but 
very early September, and, and since now I'm thinking that since the roadside shooting, whatever that ridiculousness was, was the fourth, it, it could have been August. Okay. But it was after, well after June seventh. It was after June seventh. Thank you, uh, Courts and Bill. Hearing had gone forward on June uh, 10th. This was a Thursday. Um, what outcome did you expect? The same one that we got when it went forward. The judge hadn't seen. Well, I mean, the, the outcome wouldn't have been the court will schedule a hearing. I mean, if the hearing had gone forward, what outcome do you ex uh, would you have expected? Well, you know, now I know that. Uh, Alec was working on Monday to get the information together. If the objection was sufficient, there's no reason he would be getting the information together on Monday. Uh, so I could have gotten the information, uh, but since that didn't happen, if we had argued it, I think I would have had the same outcome. Because he didn't. You know, you know, let me just make it a little simpler. Would the court have issued an order? Right? Some order would have issued on the motion. I, yeah, I, I would expect an order to issue. Break it down. An order would have issued at some point later, and what, if it were granting your motion, what would that order say? I think it would say the same thing as. Well, well sir, that says a motion hearing will be will be scheduled if necessary. It obviously wouldn't say that. So, what it, would the order granting well, the you, motion say? Look, I, again, it, what it says is is that once Mr. Tiller gets the information from Alec gives it to me, if necessary, if I deem it insufficient, then we'll have another hearing and we'll argue about it. So, so that's what I expect. It's a voluntary expect. disclosure, and then if you deem that insufficient, we go have a motion to compel here? That's the way motions to compel go every single day. So if you deemed it insufficient, if, if the court actually had to issue an order on your motion, what, you would have gotten every, you've gotten his, um, would the law firm books have been open to you? I don't know that I'm asking for the law firm books. I'm asking for Alex. Right. Uh, would you, you have gotten what, a financial statement? No. The court would have ordered uh, every account detail listed to you, all those personal accounts, just because you asked for it to inform a settlement decision? I was asking for the names of the institutions where he had accounts. I've told you that a couple right, times. Right, to so. subpoena. Sure. And, but that's different and than that giving me. And that would have been resisted and there would have been further litigation. This, this process would have taken some time, wouldn't it, if it was resisted, mm -hmm. right? I'm not sure if what was resisted. If you got the names of the banks and issued subpoenas, there would be motions to quash the subpoenas. Well, I, you know, you're, you're right? speculating it's same as you're asking me to speculate. I'm trying to talk to you about what the judge actually did and what was actually in front of the judge. I get you don't want to talk about that, but you know, and we can speculate any number of things could have happened. That at some point in the future, you would maybe get a voluntary disclosure and if you didn't like it, then the motion would be heard, the motion to compel. That, that's, that's what you say it says, right? Well, <laughs> if we had shown up and they had made the argument that you're advancing here, then maybe in this imaginary world, there's things that didn't happen. The judge would have uh, actually ruled on it. We would have we would have a ruling on whether or not it was relevant, whether or not I was entitled to it. Um, and you'd have been relevant for Alex, but not for Parker's. Look, it, there, there are different things that are being asked here. And 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 to your point, if it were the same, why didn't the judge sign the same order? that you say he would have done. That's not what he did. At the same time we argued the Parker's motion, we argued the motion for Ellick. And so he came to two different conclusions on those issues. One is he said it's premature. The other is, is that Mr. Tiller's gonna get the information, 
give it to the plaintiffs, and if it's not sufficient, we'll have another hearing. I don't know how you can be any clearer than that. So just, and maybe, maybe we can agree on this, um, the hearing had gone forward June 10th. That day would not have been the, some sort of judgment day when everything unravels, correct? There would have been further activity, maybe a voluntary disclosure, an analysis by you whether it's adequate, another hearing if you thought it wasn't, maybe some subpoenas would go out. There was going to be some time after that. Is that fair? I think it's fair that to say that there wouldn't have been an explosion on June the 10th, but the fuse was lit the moment that that information became available in the case. Not as much to me, but certainly to Danny Henderson, who would have, like the phone records, like some of the other materials, reviewed it before I got it. And Ellick would have known that. I mean, in, in that analogy, isn't aren't you really saying that the fuse was lit and the you were going after his assets, and that fuse is going to go down until trial because you're going to go to trial against him, and that's when the fuse would burn down. I think the fuse was lit when he started stealing money. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't lit on. It wasn't going to be lit on June tenth. They're certainly getting a lot more oxygen. But it's, it was lit way before, and it was going to keep burning well after June 10th. I, I don't know about well after, but it, it, it wouldn't have been judgment day on June the 10th, but, but he would have known it was beginning to unravel. Not judgment day. Okay. No further questions. Sir. Yes, sir. Very briefly, Your Honor. And, and that's really uh, the point, isn't it, though, that had that hearing taken place on June 10th, 2021, it could potentially set in motion or was going to set in motion a process that ultimately would not have ended until there was either settlement or disclosure of that information, correct? I believe so. And so just the fact of that hearing taking place and whether it's an order or representations by the defense or whatever it is, that process, if it occurs, starts and it has an inevitable conclusion, correct? Objection. Your Honor. There's only one. Objection, Your Honor. Leading. Don't leave the witness. If the hearing takes place on June 10th, 2021, what is the net effect of what could happen at that point? The discovery of everything he's done. Whether it happens that day or some point in time. Correct. <clears throat> you had filed this motion to compel, or had you filed this motion to compel, um, because you had been advised supposedly that Al was broke and you didn't believe it. Exclusively for that reason. And you believed that if he was broke, he had to be hiding assets. And if he were hiding assets, he didn't want me to discover it, which would be the pressure point. Were you merely asking for a financial declaration uh, at this June 10th, 21 hearing? No, I, I, I was. It's broader than that, I, but I wanted the institutions because I knew I couldn't trust the number I would have gotten. From Alec. From Alec. You were asked a little bit about having not pled certain theories yet at this point in time, such as negligent entrustment. Can you explain a little bit about why that was, if that was still out there? It was only out there in the sense of the pleadings that were on file. I mean, we, John Tiller had already agreed to the amendment uh, it was already coming. I had shown him the videos. 
uh, a long time before that uh, of alcohol, the Facebook, social media, likes of Paul consuming alcohol, having alcohol. Um, so only on the documents that were filed. Sir, were those issues, though, in play in your conversations with the defense? I'm sorry? Were those issues already in play in your conversations with the defense? I'm not, I'm not quite following you. Which, which issues? Additional theories of liability that might not have been filed. Oh, oh absolutely. No, I mean, it, the, those were, all I'm saying is, is that, that the black ink wasn't on the white paper, but John Tiller knew we had discussed these are the issues. this back to you, but I'd show you what's been marked as States 407 so you can recognize that. Yes, this is the order that I handed, whatever that lawyer's name was. Mr. Barber? Yes. Okay. And that's from October of 2021, is that correct? It is. You had uh, previously testified that uh, one million dollars, you know, was not really was not going to be enough, at least prior to the murders. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, had you come up with a number that had been conveyed that was far, far in excess of that? Uh, a demand to Alec? Yes. Yes. And that also included uh, signing over Moselle and Edisto. It was an option, uh, as well as a payment plan. Payment plan was an option. I mean, it, it was, you could pay this amount, you can sign over these properties, work out a payment plan on the balance. I didn't care how we got it done. It was just a matter of him doing it. Was the payment plan an option because you believe that he still would have a lucrative law practice from which he could generate money to pay your clients? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Step down.